brought to you by Wikivd Documentaries. Fidel Castro Fidel Alejandro Castro Ruz was a Cuban revolutionary and politician who governed the Republic of Cuba as Prime Minister from 1959 to 1976, and then as President from 1976 to 2008. Politically a Marxist-Leninist and Cuban nationalist, he also served as the first secretary of the Communist Party of Cuba from 1961 until 2011. Under his administration, Cuba became a one-party socialist state, industry and business were nationalized, and state socialist reforms were implemented throughout society. Born in Baran, Oriente as the son of a wealthy Spanish farmer, Castro adopted leftist anti-imperialist politics while studying law at the University of Havana. After participating in rebellions against right-wing governments in the Dominican Republic and Colombia, he planned the overthrow of Cuban President Fulgencio Batisti, launching a failed attack on the Moncada barracks in 1953. After a year's imprisonment, he traveled to Mexico where he formed a revolutionary group, the 26th of July Movement with his brother Raul Castro and Che Guevara. Returning to Cuba, Castro took a key role in the Cuban Revolution by leading the movement in a guerrilla war against Batista's forces from the Sierra Maestra. After Batista's overthrow in 1959, Castro assumed military and political power as Cuba's prime minister. The United States came to oppose Castro's government and unsuccessfully attempted to remove him by assassination, economic blockade, and counter-revolution, including the Bay of Pigs invasion of 1961. Countering these threats, Castro formed an alliance with the Soviet Union and allowed the Soviets to place nuclear weapons in Cuba, sparking the Cuban Missile Crisis, a defining incident of the Cold War, in 1962. Adopting a Marxist-Leninist model of development, Castro converted Cuba into a one-party socialist state under Communist Party rule, the first in the Western Hemisphere. Policies introducing central economic planning and expanding health care and education were accompanied by state control of the press and the suppression of internal dissent abroad. Castro supported anti-imperialist revolutionary groups, backing the establishment of Marxist governments in Chile, Nicaragua, and Granada, and sending troops to aid allies in the Yom Kippur War, Ogaden War, and Angolan Civil War. These actions, coupled with Castro's leadership of the non-aligned movement from 1979 to 1983, in Cuba's medical internationalism, increased Cuba's profile on the world stage. Following the Soviet Union's dissolution in 1991, Castro led Cuba into its special period and embraced environmentalist and anti-globalization ideas. In the 2000s he forged alliances in the Latin American pink tide, namely with Hugo Chavez Venezuela, and signed Cuba up to the Bolivarian Alliance for the Americas. In 2006 he transferred his responsibilities to Vice President Raul Castro, who was elected to the presidency by the National Assembly in 2008. The longest-serving non-royal head of state in the 20th and 21st centuries, Castro polarized world opinion. His supporters view him as a champion of socialism and anti-imperialism whose revolutionary regime advanced economic and social justice while securing Cuba's independence from American imperialism. Critics view him as a dictator whose administration oversaw human rights abuses, the exodus of a large number of Cubans, and the impoverishment of the country's economy. He was decorated with various international awards and significantly influenced various individuals and groups across the world.
Youth, 1926-1947. Castro was born out of wedlock at his father's farm on August 13, 1926. His father, Angel Castro y Argiz, was a migrant to Cuba from Galicia, northwest Spain. He had become financially successful by growing sugarcane at Las Manicas farm in Baran, Oriente province, and after the collapse of his first marriage, he took his household servant. Lina Ruz Gonzalez also of Spanish origin as his mistress and later second wife. Together they had seven children, among them Fidel. Age six Castro was sent to live with his teacher in Santiago de Cuba, before being baptized into the Roman Catholic Church. At the age of eight, being baptized enabled Castro to attend the La Salle boarding school in Santiago, where he regularly misbehaved, so he was sent to the privately funded Jesuit-run Dolores School in Santiago. In 1945 he transferred to the more prestigious Jesuit-run El Colegio de Belén in Havana. Although Castro took an interest in history, geography and debating at Belén, he did not excel academically, instead devoting much of his time to playing sports. In 1945, Castro began studying law at the University of Havana, admitting he was politically illiterate. He became embroiled in student activism and the violent gangsterismo culture within the university. Passionate about anti-imperialism, and opposing U.S. intervention in the Caribbean, he unsuccessfully campaigned for the presidency of the Federation of University Students on a platform of honesty, decency, and justice. Castro became critical of the corruption and violence of President Ramon Grau's government, delivering a public speech on the subject in November 1946 that received coverage on the front page of several newspapers. In 1947, Castro joined the Party of the Cuban People, founded by veteran politician Eduardo Chibar. A charismatic figure, Chibar advocated social justice, honest government, and political freedom, while his party exposed corruption and demanded reform. Though Chibar came third in the 1948 general election, Castro remained committed to working on his behalf. Student violence escalated after Grau employed gang leaders as police officers, and Castro soon received a death threat urging him to leave the university, refusing. He began carrying a gun and surrounding himself with armed friends. In later years anti-Castro, dissidents accused him of committing gang-related assassinations at the time, but these remain unproven. Rebellion and Marxism, 1947-1950 In June 1947, Castro learned of a planned expedition to overthrow the right-wing government of Rafael Trujillo, a U.S. ally. In the Dominican Republic, being president of the University Committee for Democracy in the Dominican Republic, Castro joined the expedition. The military force consisted of around 1,200 troops, mostly Cubans and exiled Dominicans, and they intended to sail from Cuba in July 1947. Grau's government stopped the invasion under U.S. pressure, although Castro and many of his comrades evaded arrest. Returning to Havana, Castro took a leading role in student protests against the killing of a high school pupil by government bodyguards. The protests, accompanied by a crackdown on those considered communists, led to violent clashes between activists and police in February 1948, in which Castro was badly beaten. At this point his public speeches took on a distinctly leftist slant by condemning social and economic inequality in Cuba. In contrast, his former public criticisms had centered on condemning corruption and U.S. imperialism. 
In April 1948, Castro traveled to Bogota, Colombia, with a Cuban student group sponsored by President Juan Perón's Argentine government. There, the assassination of popular leftist leader George A. L. E. E. C. G. T. A. N. I. A. L. A. led to widespread rioting and clashes between the governing conservatives, backed by the army, and leftist liberals. Castro joined the liberal cause by stealing guns from a police station. But subsequent police investigations concluded that he had not been involved in any killings. Returning to Cuba, Castro became a prominent figure in protests against government attempts to raise bus fares. That year, he married Mirtha Diaz Ballot, a student from a wealthy family through whom he was exposed to the lifestyle of the Cuban elite. The relationship was a love match disapproved of by both families. But Diaz Ballot's father gave them tens of thousands of dollars to spend on a three-month New York City honeymoon. That same year, Grau decided not to stand for re-election, which was instead won by his Partido Autetico's new candidate, Carlos Prio Socorros. Prio faced widespread protests when members of the MSR, now allied to the police force, assassinated Justo Fuentes, a socialist friend of Castro's. In response, Prio agreed to quell the gangs, but found them too powerful to control. Castro had moved further to the left, influenced by the Marxist writings of Karl Marx, Friedrich Engels, and Vladimir Lenin. He came to interpret Cuba's problems as an integral part of capitalist society, or the dictatorship of the bourgeoisie, rather than the failings of corrupt politicians, and adopted the Marxist view that meaningful political change could only be brought about by proletariat revolution, visiting Havana's poorest neighborhoods. He became active in the student anti-racist campaign. In September 1949, Mirtha gave birth to a son, Fidelitu, so the couple moved to a larger Havana flat. Castro continued to put himself at risk, staying active in the city's politics and joining the September 30th movement which contained within it both communists and members of the Partido Ortodoxo. The group's purpose was to oppose the influence of the violent gangs within the university. Despite his promises, Prio had failed to control the situation, instead offering many of their senior members jobs in government ministries. Castro volunteered to deliver a speech for the movement on November 13, exposing the government's secret deals with the gangs and identifying key members, attracting the attention of the national press. The speech angered the gangs, and Castro fled into hiding, first in the countryside, and then in the U.S. Returning to Havana several weeks later, Castro lay low and focused on his university studies, graduating as a Doctor of Law in September 1950. Career in Law and Politics, 1950-1952 Castro co-founded a legal partnership that primarily catered for poor Cubans. Although it proved a financial failure, Caring little for money and material goods, Castro failed to pay his bills, his furniture was repossessed and electricity cut off, distressing his wife. He took part in a high school protest in Cienfuegos in November 1950, fighting with police in protest at the Education Ministry's ban on student associations, arrested and charged for violent conduct, the magistrate dismissed the charges. His hopes for Cuba still centered on Chibar and the Partido Ortodoxo, and he was present at Chibar's politically motivated suicide in 1951. Seeing himself as Chibar's heir, Castro wanted to run for Congress in the June 1952 elections. Though senior Orthodoxo members feared his radical reputation and refused to nominate him, 
Instead, he was nominated as a candidate for the House of Representatives by party members in Havana's poorest districts, and began campaigning. The Orthodoxo had considerable support and was predicted to do well in the election. During his campaign, Castro met with General Fulgencio Batisti, the former president who had returned to politics with the Unitary Action Party. Although both opposing Prio's administration, their meeting never got beyond polite generalities. On March 10, 1952, Batista seized power in a military coup, with Prio fleeing to Mexico. Declaring himself president, Batista cancelled the planned presidential elections. Describing his new system as disciplined democracy, Castro, like many others, considered it a one-man dictatorship. Batista moved to the right, solidifying ties with both the wealthy elite and the United States, severing diplomatic relations with the Soviet Union, suppressing trade unions and persecuting Cuban socialist groups. Intent on opposing Batista, Castro brought several legal cases against the government. But these came to nothing, and Castro began thinking of alternate ways to oust the regime. The movement and the Moncada Barracks attack, 1952-1953. Castro formed a group called The Movement, which operated along a clandestine cell system, publishing underground newspaper El Acusador, while arming and training anti-Batista recruits. From July 1952 they went on a recruitment drive, gaining around 1,200 members in a year, the majority from Havana's poorer districts. Although a revolutionary socialist, Castro avoided an alliance with the communist PSP, fearing it would frighten away political moderates, but kept in contact with PSP members like his brother Raul. Castro stockpiled weapons for a planned attack on the Moncada Barracks, a military garrison outside Santiago de Cuba. Oriente. Castro's militants intended to dress in army uniforms and arrive at the base on July 25, seizing control and raiding the armory before reinforcements arrived, supplied with new weaponry. Castro intended to spark a revolution among Orient's impoverished cane cutters and promote further uprisings. Castro's plan emulated those of the 19th century Cuban independence fighters who had raided Spanish barracks. Castro saw himself as the heir to independence leader Jose Marti. Castro gathered 165 revolutionaries for the mission, ordering his troops not to cause bloodshed unless they met armed resistance. The attack took place on July 26, 1953, but ran into trouble. Three of the 16 cars that had set out from Santiago failed to get there. Reaching the barracks, the alarm was raised, with most of the rebels pinned down by machine gun fire. Four were killed before Castro ordered a retreat. The rebels suffered six fatalities and 15 other casualties, whilst the army suffered 19 dead and 27 wounded. Meanwhile, some rebels took over a civilian hospital, subsequently stormed by government soldiers. The rebels were rounded up, tortured and 22 were executed without trial. Accompanied by 19 comrades, Castro set out for Gran Piedra in the rugged Sierra Maestra Mountains several miles to the north, where they could establish a guerrilla base. Responding to the attack, Batista's government proclaimed martial law, ordering a violent crackdown on dissent, and imposing strict media censorship. The government broadcast misinformation about the event, claiming that the rebels were communists who had killed hospital patients, although news and photographs of the army's use of torture and summary executions in Oriente soon spread, causing widespread public and some governmental disapproval. Over the following days, 
the rebels were rounded up, some were executed and others, including Castro, transported to a prison north of Santiago. Believing Castro incapable of planning the attack alone, the government accused Orthodox SO and PSP politicians of involvement putting 122 defendants on trial on September 21 at the Palace of Justice, Santiago. Acting as his own defense counsel, Castro cited Marti as the intellectual author of the attack, and convinced the three judges to overrule the army's decision to keep all defendants handcuffed in court, proceeding to argue that the charge with which they were accused of organizing an uprising of armed persons against the constitutional powers of the state was incorrect, for they had risen up against Batisti, who had seized power in an unconstitutional manner. The trial embarrassed the army by revealing that they had tortured suspects, after which they tried unsuccessfully to prevent Castro from testifying any further, claiming he was too ill. The trial ended on October 5, with the acquittal of most defendants. Fifty-five were sentenced to prison terms of between seven months and thirteen years. Castro was sentenced on October 16, during which he delivered a speech that would be printed under the title of History Will Absolve Me. Castro was sentenced to fifteen years' imprisonment in the hospital wing of the model prison a relatively comfortable and modern institution on the Isla de Pinos. Imprisonment and July 26 Movement, 1953-1955 Imprisoned with 25 comrades, Castro renamed his group the 26th of July Movement in memory of the Moncada attacks date and formed a school for prisoners. He read widely, enjoying the works of Marx, Lenin, and Marty, but also reading books by Freud, Kant, Shakespeare, Munch, Mormon Dostoyevsky, analyzing them within a Marxist framework. Corresponding with supporters, he maintained control over the movement and organized the publication of History Will Absolve Me. Initially permitted a relative amount of freedom within the prison, he was locked up in solitary confinement after inmates sang anti batista songs on a visit by the president in February 1954. Meanwhile, Castro's wife Mirtha gained employment in the Ministry of the Interior, something he discovered through a radio announcement. Appalled, he raged that he would rather die a thousand times than suffer impotently from such an insult. Both Fidel and Mirtha initiated divorce proceedings, with Mirtha taking custody of their son Fidelitu. This angered Castro, who did not want his son growing up in a bourgeois environment. In 1954, Batista's government held presidential elections, but no politician stood against him. The election was widely considered fraudulent. It had allowed some political opposition to be voiced, and Castro's supporters had agitated for an amnesty for the Moncada incident's perpetrators. Some politicians suggested an amnesty would be good publicity, and the Congress and Batista agreed, backed by the U.S. and major corporations, Batista believed Castro to be no threat, and on May 15, 1955, the prisoners were released. Returning to Havana, Castro gave radio interviews and press conferences, the government closely monitored him, curtailing his activities. Now divorced, Castro had sexual affairs with two female supporters, Nati Revuelter and Maria Labert, each conceiving him a child. Setting about strengthening the Mr. 26-7, he established an 11-person national directorate but retained autocratic control, with some dissenters labeling him a cordillo. He argued that a successful revolution could not be run by committee and required a strong leader. In 1955, bombings and violent demonstrations led to a crackdown on dissent, with Castro 
and Raul fleeing the country to evade arrest. Castro sent a letter to the press declaring that he was leaving Cuba because all doors of peaceful struggle have been closed. To me, as a follower of Marti, I believe the hour has come to take our rights and not beg for them to fight instead of pleading for them. The Castros and several comrades traveled to Mexico, where Raúl befriended an Argentine doctor and Marxist-Leninist named Ernesto Che Guevara, who was working as a journalist and photographer for Agencia Latina de Noticias. Fidel liked him, later describing him as a more advanced revolutionary than I was. Castro also associated with the Spaniard Alberto Bayo, who agreed to teach Castro's rebels the necessary skills in guerrilla warfare, requiring funding. Castro toured the U.S. in search of wealthy sympathizers, there being monitored by Batista's agents, who allegedly orchestrated a failed assassination attempt against him. Castro kept in contact with the Mr. 26-7 in Cuba, where they had gained a large support base in Oriente. Other militant anti-Batista groups had sprung up, primarily from the student movement. Most notable was the Directorio Revolucionario Estudiantil, founded by José Antonio Echeverria. Antonio met with Castro in Mexico City, but Castro opposed the students' support for indiscriminate assassination. After purchasing the decrepit yacht Granma on November 25, 1956, Castro set sail from Tuxpan, Veracruz, with 81 armed revolutionaries. The crossing to Cuba was harsh, with food running low and many suffering seasickness. At some points, they had to bail water caused by a leak, and at another, a man fell overboard, delaying their journey. The plan had been for the crossing to take five days, and on the grandma's scheduled day of arrival, November 30, Mr. 26-7 members under Frank Pais led an armed uprising in Santiago and Manzanillo. However, the Granma's journey ultimately lasted seven days, and with Castro and his men unable to provide reinforcements, Pais and his militants dispersed after two days of intermittent attacks. Guerrilla War, 1956-1959 The Grandma ran aground in a mangrove swamp at Playa Las Coloradas, close to Los Cahuelos. On December 2, 1956, fleeing inland, its crew headed for the forested mountain range of Orient Sierra Maestra, being repeatedly attacked by Batista's troops. Upon arrival, Castro discovered that only 19 rebels had made it to their destination, the rest having been killed or captured, setting up an encampment. The survivors included the Castros, Che Guevara, and Camilo Cienfuegos. They began launching raids on small army posts to obtain weaponry, and in January 1957 they overran the outpost at La Plata, treating any soldiers that they wounded, but executing Chicho Osorio, the local mayoral, who was despised by the local peasants, and who boasted of killing one of Castro's rebels. Osorio's execution aided the rebels in gaining the trust of locals, although they largely remained unenthusiastic and suspicious of the revolutionaries. As trust grew, some locals joined the rebels, although most new recruits came from urban areas, with volunteers boosting the rebel forces to over 200. In July 1957 Castro divided his army into three columns, commanded by himself, his brother, and Guevara. The Mr. 26 seven members operating in urban areas continued agitation, sending supplies to Castro, and on February 16, 1957, he met with other senior members to discuss tactics. Here he met Celia Sanchez, who would become a close friend across Cuba. 
anti-Batista groups carried out bombings and sabotage, police responded with mass arrests, torture, and extrajudicial executions. In March 1957, the doctor launched a failed attack on the presidential palace, during which Antonio was shot dead. Frank Pais was also killed, leaving Castro the Mr. 26-7's unchallenged leader. Although Guevara and Raul were well known for their Marxist-Leninist views, Castro hid his hoping to gain the support of less radical revolutionaries. In 1957 he met with leading members of the Partido Ortodoxo, Raul Chibar and Felipe Pazos, authoring the Sierra Maestra Manifesto, in which they demanded that a provisional civilian government be set up to implement moderate agrarian reform, industrialization, and a literacy campaign before holding multi-party elections, as Cuba's press was censored. Castro contacted foreign media to spread his message. He became a celebrity after being interviewed by Herbert Matthews, a journalist from the New York Times. Reporters from CBS and Paris Match soon followed. Castro's guerrillas increased their attacks on military outposts, forcing the government to withdraw from the Sierra Maestra region, and by spring 1958, the rebels controlled a hospital, schools, a printing press, slaughterhouse, landmine factory and a cigar-making factory. By 1958, Batista was under increasing pressure, a result of his military failures coupled with increasing domestic and foreign criticism surrounding his administration's press censorship, torture, and extrajudicial executions. Influenced by anti-Batista sentiment among their citizens, the U.S. government ceased supplying him with weaponry. The opposition called a general strike, accompanied by armed attacks from the Mr. 26-7, beginning on April 9. It received strong support in central and eastern Cuba, but little elsewhere. Batista responded with an all-out attack, Operation Verano, in which the army aerially bombarded forested areas and villages suspected of aiding the militants, while 10,000 soldiers commanded by General Eulogio Cantio surrounded the Sierra Maestra, driving north to the rebel encampments. Despite their numerical and technological superiority, the army had no experience with guerrilla warfare, and Castro halted their offensive using landmines and ambushes. Many of Batista's soldiers defected to Castro's rebels, who also benefited from local popular support. In the summer, the Mr. 26-7 went on the offensive, pushing the army out of the mountains with Castro using his columns in a pincer movement to surround the main army concentration in Santiago. By November, Castro's forces controlled most of Oriente and Las Villas, and divided Cuba in two by closing major roads and rail lines, severely disadvantaging Batisti. Fearing Castro was a socialist, the U.S. instructed Cantio to oust Batisti. Cantio secretly agreed to a ceasefire with Castro, promising that Batista would be tried as a war criminal. However, Batista was warned and fled into exile with over $300 million on December 31, 1958. Cantio entered Havana's presidential palace, proclaimed the Supreme Court Judge Carlos Piedra to be president, and began appointing the new government. Furious, Castro ended the ceasefire and ordered Cantillo's arrest by sympathetic figures in the army. Accompanying celebrations at news of Batista's downfall on January 1, 1959, Castro ordered the Mr. 26-7 to prevent widespread looting and vandalism. See in Fuegos and Guevara led their columns into Havana on January 2, while Castro entered Santiago and gave a speech invoking the wars of independence. Heading toward Havana, he greeted cheering crowds at every town, giving press conferences and interviews.
Thank you for watching. Brought to you by Wikivd Documentaries. Please like and subscribe below. Please like and subscribe below.